Coming up on American Black Journal, we will continue our look at the Black church in Detroit with a roundtable of female ministers who will talk about the historic and present role of women in the Black church. We'll also take a look at a piece about the iconic Black Madonna painting that brought national attention to a Detroit church. Stay where you are. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, Ally, Impact at Home, UAW Solidarity Forever, and viewers like you, thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson, and as always, I'm glad you've joined us. Today, we're continuing our year-long look at the Black Church in Detroit, which is produced in partnership with the Ecumenical Theological Seminary and the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. In honor of Women's History Month, we're taking a look at the role of women in the Black Church. Here in Detroit, their influence was depicted in a painting that shocked the nation when it was unveiled more than 50 years ago at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. The portrait of a Black Madonna and baby Jesus was not only a symbol of Black liberation and power, it also represented the strength of the Black woman in the fight for freedom and equality. Producer Marcus Green has this story. I call upon my brothers, I call upon my sisters, Together, we can overcome evil and injustice in this world if we choose to act with courage and conviction. Women in the church have always been the backbone of the church, but the backbone in the background. And, and that's not where we are here. The church started in 1953 after our founder, Reverend Albert B. Clay Jr. left uh, the Presbyterian Church, St. Mark's Presbyterian because he felt like he didn't have the latitude to do the kind of social ministry that he wanted to do. And in 1962, they purchased this building uh, and it became the Central United Church of Christ. In 67, uh, with the unveiling of the portrait of the Black Madonna, also came the launch of Black Christian Nationalism. That was the movement that gave birth to uh, Black liberation theology and everything we know about that struggle. I heard all sorts of pushback. I heard, that's ridiculous. I heard, did you see? She's so dark, she's ugly. I heard, um, well, what's that light-skinned man doing with that dark baby and child up in his church? Everybody knows, blah, blah, blah. There was a lot of pushback. But from then to now, it is amazing to see how many brown angels, brown Madonnas, brown Jesus are in churches from the storefront to the big cathedrals. Some churches, the Baptist churches, some uh, what you call holiness or sanctified churches, didn't allow women in the pulpit. If a black woman was permitted to give the um, announcements for the church, she had to stand in front of the pulpit, not on the pulpit. And you didn't hear of black women preachers. It inspired a whole uh, 
revolution of iconography, black iconography, not just religious, but also cultural and social iconography. So it, it had a tremendous impact on, on the, the culture and the social uh, force of, of black communities, white communities, all across the world. And also he wanted to pay tribute to the, the role of black women in our historical struggle for freedom and justice and equality. And who better to represent that than the mother of Jesus, Mary? You know how they first started to talk about, uh, we as a community said, well, we needed representation, right? And so we wanted to see ourselves in various careers. Well, what better to see yourself as? The mother of Jesus represents motherhood and, and the important role that women play in the family, in the community. But also, I think, as she's an example of our willingness to serve God. So she represents that uh, highest level of servanthood uh, to be used as an instrument to do the work of God here on earth every single day. Emil Carl Cabral said you can judge a people by how they value their elders and their women. And people often think about that as, you know, value, put her up on a pedestal. Isn't she pretty? Let's buy her something cute to wear. Isn't she lovely? I'll open the door. I want a door opened, okay? And I love it when my husband buys me something pretty. But respect and making use of the talents. If you don't fully make use of the talents of women, the community is forever robbed. We put together a round table of women leaders in the black church to talk about faith, religion, and gender equality in the ministry. Here's my conversation with Reverend Dr. Joanne Watson of Westside Unity Church, Reverend Cindy Rudolph from Oak Grove AME, and Reverend Kanita Harris of Detroit Bible Tabernacle. So uh, Reverend Watson, I'm gonna start with you. It seems to me that when you talk about the, the idea of the role of uh, black women and uh, black women leadership in the church, you're by definition talking about uh, change. You're by definition talking about transition, that, that this is a role that has changed a number of times across history and is changing even now. Uh, how does that look from your, from your chair? Oh, absolutely. It's a transforming uh, ministry with women, particularly Black women who are in ministry. Uh, my observation has been that most Black women in ministry have been mentored by other Black women in ministry. My mother was a minister in AME Church, mm. Greater Queen AME, um, fifth generation AME. My mentor in the Unity Church was Reverend Dr. Ruth M. Mosley, who founded Westside Unity, the church I pastor. Uh, more than uh, uh, 56 years ago. And uh, she also founded the Unity Urban Ministerial School, the theological seminary I graduated from. So women, you know, Reverend Irma Henderson, many people don't know she was not only a political leader, she was also an ordained minister uh, who was a, a great mentor to me as was Martha Jean McQueen, who was not only a broadcaster, but she was also an ordained minister. So I've been very blessed to have been surrounded by women of faith throughout. Mother Rosa Parks called me one of her daughters. She was a life member of the AME church and a, and a missionary society. So I believe women, black women in particular in the black church have been transforming our, our movements uh, throughout the, the period that there's been a black church in this country. And, and uh, Reverend Watson, the, the leadership role that we see uh, also changing and, and emerging for, for Black women. Talk about what's driving that change right now. Uh, I believe that, that certainly Black women uh, in ministry, spiritually uh, rooted women, are the reason that there's such political change in the air right now nationally. There, there would not be a President Joe Biden, help me somebody, if there were not for Black women. That's black right. women. Yes. All over Atlanta. One of my mentors is in Atlanta. And she told me directly how she ushered 60 black women, church women, into the rural areas of Georgia who were signed to get people in rural areas of Georgia to the polls to vote. And that has transformed this country. And the reason we're all receiving a stimulus right now is because of those black church women. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, Reverend Harris, I'm curious uh, because you're uh, a young uh, minister, a black minister, female minister. Um, you know, historically, there's a tension between uh, the sort of patriarchy in the, in the black church uh, and, and the need and the desire for women to, to, to be in leadership. But I wonder as somebody who's, who's younger and, and is experiencing that tension now, what it, what it looks like, uh, what it looks like for you. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that definitely is, is the case, uh, unfortunately. The, the tension of being a woman and what we say in the church, being called to ministry um, when a call has been placed on your life. And I think for me uh, personally, one of the things that I have been really blessed to have is um, to be in a church uh, that I grew up in. Um, and I left away to do ministry in other parts of the country. But when I came back, I came back to the home church, um, the church that was started out of my home that I was raised in by my uh, father and my mother, um, Kenneth Harris and Ruthie Harris. And um, when I t went to my parents and told them, I said, I, I have a call for ministry. I'm called into the ministry. And, you know, and to be able to have um, a a father who was in ministry um, for a number of years and actually was one of the first, I wanna say Baptist pastors in the area who had ordained a woman to be associate minister at my church. And so I grew up um, sort of within a fellowship where I heard the spirit speak through the black female voice. That wasn't something that, you know, sort of was suppressed or, or was looked down upon in any kind of way. And so I was, I was used to that, but then I quickly found out as we would go in fellowship at other churches in the area, that that was not the same value. That same value of women being in ministry was not really upheld in the same way. Um, and so I had, sort of the gift of having parents who were really affirming of the call that was on my life. Now, as that sort of, as that, after I left home and went out to do ministry in the world, then I ran into, you know, those challenges. And, and I think one of the things that I think that we as Black women in ministry is that we every time defy the, the stereotypes, we defy um, sort of the limitations, I think, that may be projected upon us in terms of saying that we're not called, that she is she is called, but there is always this narrative and has been this narrative of she is not called. And so what we, what we see in, in our history is that black women have contributed to the life of the church and that there would not even be a church, a black church, if it was not for the presence of, of women in terms of our ministry and the special way in which we show up. Um, in terms of nurturing in within the walls of the church, but also that extending out into the community. And so for me, it makes me think about um, actually a woman historically in the AME church that I had just learned about through the Black Church series um, and, and just hearing about her story and how she was demanding to be uh, you know, recognized as a person in ministry um, and saying that I too am called to be a laborer in the gospel. And so that is what we have always said throughout history. Our, our testimony has been, I too am called. Um, and, and we have been able to demonstrate that the spirit does speak through us and show up through us in the work of our hands um, and our voices being used prophetically and politically, I think, to speak truth to power and to understand um, how, that, how that affects and shapes our communities. Pastor Rudolph, I wonder if you can talk about uh, the difference between, uh, Reverend Harris got at this a little bit, the difference between the internal challenge of being uh, a female leader in a black church, in other words, the challenge you might face with uh, your congregation or your church, and the external uh, challenges that you, you face kind of representing your church uh, in, in a broader community that still has uh, that, that strong patriarchy that, that, that resists the idea of female leadership. So I have been in ministry for 21 years now. And in that 21 years, I've seen a lot and experienced a lot. I have been discriminated against. I have been outright dismissed because of my gender. I've been told to my face uh, that women should not be pastors or should not preach. 
Um, and so I, I've certainly experienced it both within the church and externally as well. Um, I've had members who would not open up um, to a female leader, um, but I must say it has not all been bad. Um, I have been mentored by both men and women. Um, I'm someone who grew up in a family of men. I have five brothers and both of my parents raised us. So it was my mother and I with six men in the household. And what I did not realize until about a year ago when I was being interviewed is that that really helped prepare me for mm -hmm. leadership in a male dominated society. And so I had no issue uh, with being supervised by a man because I was accustomed to that with my father. I had no issue seeing men as my peers because I was accustomed to that with my brothers. And because I had both younger and older brothers, I did what older siblings do. I bossed around my younger brothers. So I had no issues supervising men either. Um, it was, and I wasn't intimidated by or anything like that. Um, but so I, I've had the challenges but I've also had really good experiences. I'm the first female pastor of a church that is a hundred years old. And my bishop uh, in the AME church, we are governed by an episcopacy, which means that we are not um, necessarily um, brought in by a congregation uh, or a congregationally led church, but we are appointed by bishops. Um, and my bishop who is a forward thinking bishop uh, was bold enough to be pioneering enough to send a female mm. pastor to a flagship church, um, which you know is uncommon sometimes. Um, and so I thank God for forward thinkers like him. I thank God for forward thinkers like my father in ministry, Reverend William Watley, um, and, and also the women who have mentored me and the women upon whose shoulders we stand. Um, Reverend Harris earlier mentioned Adrena Lee, who was um, licensed to preach in the AME church back in 1819 yeah. and um, was not ordained. She was refused ordination though, was not ordained until 2016 when we posthumously ordained her. Wow. Um, and she preached and preached and did ministry all over. Um, but we thank God that we finally did affirm her gifts and her calling mm -hmm. and her ordination uh, posthumously. Amen. Um, so for me, it's been it's been a mixed experience. I have suffered discrimination, but I've also been affirmed very publicly as well as privately. And I thank God for the ways in which my upbringing prepared me to uh, excel in a male-dominated field. Mm -hmm. uh, Amen. You're such a political icon in our city. I wonder if you can talk about uh, the difference between uh, the struggle against patriarchy in politics and the struggle against patriarchy in the church. Which one uh, was easier to navigate than the other? And were there things that you could bring from the church to, uh, to, to, to fight against uh, patriarchy in politics? Well, it's interesting though that you mentioned that because I've had a practice just because of my own personal uh, intent of bringing the Bible uh, to the council table every day. Uh, and Lord knows some sessions we needed prayer, but uh, <laughs> that was just what I was part of who I was. And I bought uh, even before my ordination. And I uh, actually had uh, someone uh, suggested uh, maybe I wasn't separating church and state enough and uh, uh, put it on an agenda for uh, discussion uh, uh, because I was bringing my, somehow my Bible was offensive to them. As it happened, as the Lord planned it, by the time that issue came up on, on the city council agenda, we happened to have had been in an evening service at a church. Come on, somebody. You know, nothing but God. Only God. <laughs> Could have ordained that so you know with the pastor in in the fellowship hall you know nobody's going to raise any issues with my bible at the council table <laughs> as we as we conduct a business meeting for the city in a, in a church fellowship hall so that so that went away without my saying a word i didn't have to say one word <laughs> the persons who were opposed didn't open their mouth but i have had uh, i was invited to be a women's day speaker at a church once a very friendly invitation. I said yes and went. Then the, the pastor said to me, now we don't allow women to speak from the pulpit, but you can speak from the lectern on the floor. 
Why? And another, another, said that, said that, uh, but we know you, you're a minister, but uh, you're a woman, so you can speak from the lectern on the floor. I said, well, uh, you know, you can give the message from any space. I can give it from the, the, from the pew, front pew, if you like, like wherever you designate, I will do that. And I've also had another minister who read my bio and saw I was a preacher's kid and start flanging his arms and saying, oh, she's the daughter of a preacher, man. She's the daughter of a preacher. So when I got to the pulpit, I had to say, I'm the daughter of a preacher mama. My mother was an AME minister. So mm. I, have, uh, I understand uh, the issues that uh, uh, sometimes address women who are ministers in our church because it's a male dominated field. And I think it's a, a part of uh, the cultural uh, assumption about who ought to be in charge of a church. And that uh, but the people just need to remember it was women who never left Jesus at the cross. It was women who went to the tomb. Right. right. It was a woman who said, Come see a man. That's right. Come see a man. So clear. It was Jesus who ushered women into ministry. So for persons who happen to be Christians, uh, they, they just need to read the word. Yeah. Um, uh, Reverend Harris, what do you think the future is for women in uh, the black church? Uh, where, are we, where are we headed? I kind of think of just my own sort of experience. I think that um, because of where we are and, and, and the place that we find ourselves in in history, uh, in human history, uh, the the look of the church is is different. Um, and and every across the church, the American church, people are thinking about what is it asking the question, what does it mean to to be the church? Right. And, and, and how does that look in terms of the ways in which we we um, do mission um, and how do we address the needs of, of those that are in our communities? And so I think for me, um, being a millennial, if you will, <laughs> that even with ministry, my ministry looks different. Um, you know, I started off as denominational staff of a, uh, a very old, uh, the oldest denomination, Protestant denomination in the country in the Reformed Church in America, um, and started off as denominational staff working in multiracial initiatives and social justice. So I was outside of the local church, but was empowering other churches across the U.S. and Canada to meet needs through community-based development sort of work. Um, and so that was ministry in that context. And then I found myself migrating to the local church. And I did work there for a few years. Now, I'm still doing that work here in the city of Detroit, but then I got called to actually go out and to do uh, work in the community development arena. So part of my ministry is being a chief operating officer for a neighborhood place-based organization called Jefferson East East on the east side of Detroit, servicing five neighborhoods and doing work around housing um, and economic development and keeping the community clean and safe. And, and that's part of my ministry too. So I have one foot in the local church and one foot in the community. And so really, the, the bridge of church and community and this intersection of faith and justice, it really does meet up in, in someone like me and, and a lot of other women who are in ministry. So to answer your question, what does ministry look like? It looks like one foot in the church and maybe one foot out in the community. It means uh, opening up coffee shops and, and holding services in those arenas. It, it looks like in so many different ways um, how we as Black women are embodying our call. Pastor Rudolph, are you seeing something similar in, in AME, which is, again, one of the oldest uh, churches and one of the first to, to recognize uh, female leadership? Absolutely. I think that the church um, is very progressive. Um, we're moving in a very progressive direction. We still have a long way to go. Um, there's still a lot that we need to do. Uh, but I do think that more and more women are taking their place. Um, I have seen for many years now, more and more women coming into the ministry uh, in the AME church. Um, and that's across the board because I've served several districts in several, several states. Um, and you often see more women than men now coming into the church. Yes. So I, I think we are absolutely being progressive. Um, as I said, we still have a long way to go because not everyone is a progressive thinker and you really need those kinds of progressive thinkers at the helm of the church. Yes. We do have some, but we certainly have um, a ways to go. But I thank God 
that we are not what, where we once were, where we were denying people opportunities and not recognizing their gifts. Um, you know, we've had uh, four female bishops elected out of the AME church. Um, that in and of itself speaks volumes. Yes. Um, and we have many female presiding elders and, you know, pastors. Uh, and as we continue on, we'll see more and more of that. That's going to do it for us this week. Thanks so much for watching. We're looking forward to bringing you more important conversations each month about the Black church in Detroit. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can always keep up with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, Ally, Impact at Home, UAW Solidarity Forever, and viewers like you, thank you.